All right, welcome everyone. Thank, thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. Um, I'm here with Dr. Deming and we're going to kick off tonight testing, tracking and training, how to integrate sports science into your training program. So before we start a few housekeeping items, do me a favor if you can silence any technology around you, cell phones, TVs, uh, we wanna make sure you get the most from this webinar today. So if you can limit distractions, that would be helpful. Next, depending on how you're accessing the webinar today, uh, take a look around and see if you can locate that Q&A button. Um, the Q&A button is where you can, if you have any feedback, if you have any questions, um, anything that you want to add in and send to us directly as we're going through the webinar today, that's the place for it. Um, at the end of the webinar today, we will be introducing our Return to Run program. Um, this is a program we kicked off a few months ago, um, which has really done a, a great job, I think, helping local runners bounce back from injury, also improve running form and performance. So we'll introduce that at the very end. If you're unable to stay for the entire webinar for whatever reason, uh, we completely understand. I will be sending the webinar out to everyone tomorrow at 11 a.m. So um, please check your email and especially the spam folder can, since it can sometimes end up in there. So as you guys saw, as you signed up for the, the webinar tonight, three specific items you want to cover um, and really kind of get into the weeds. weeds then. One, what does a 3D running and biomechanics evaluation look like? And this is really uh, on Dr. Deming's end, uh, done a really good job on, on creating this very uh, efficient, effective uh, running analysis and, and different programs with um, and 3D software to look at that. So that'll be interesting to hear about what kind of running form data can be collected and why that matters to you as a runner if you're looking to uh, reduce or eliminate pain or improve performance. And then we'll dig in a little bit about certain areas of running form, uh, specifically pelvic drop and foot pronation. How do we address these poor movement patterns for you to hopefully run faster, stronger, and longer and reduce your likelihood of injury? Um, before we begin, do me a favor, silence any technology around you, grab a pen and paper, If see if there's anything small that you grab from here today. I want to make sure not just here listening and, and, and taking in this information, but also um, doing your due diligence and figuring out tomorrow what you can do to, to take action and see better results with your running moving forward. Uh, Dr. Deming, if you want to kick us off here, tell us a little bit about you and we'll get through the bios here. Sure. Uh, thanks, Garrett. Um, this is great to be doing this. I'm happy to be here. Um, so <clears throat> my name is John Deming. Um, I am a physician, uh, a doctor of podiatric medicine. Um, I have about 10 years of practice in the traditional multi-specialty -me multi medical group uh, prior to opening my new venture called True to Form. Um, I opened this a couple of years ago in hopes of being able to treat more of the cause and helping people get down to um, you know, the biomechanical issues that are causing many of their uh, injuries specifically geared towards uh, runners. Um, and uh, now I am uh, working with uh, Garrett, as he mentioned earlier, um, to team up and provide both sides of the equation now. So it's identifying the cause, um, recognizing the issue, and then fixing it. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Awesome. So my name is Garrett McLaughlin. I'm a licensed athletic trainer, um, strength conditioning coach and running coach. So I've been here in the uh, Portage, Michigan area since September. Uh, recently just moved and bought a house here, but um, seen and worked in a lot of different capacities over the years in your traditional athletic training, sports medicine, working with um, it was Division One sports team, worked with a lot of different, a lot of different uh, teams, professional ultimate frisbee and uh, did some time an uh, internship at Olympic Training Center and and big Division One football schools. Uh, over the years, I've I've tried I've tried to switch gears and kind of like Dr. Deming mentioned, um, didn't want to really react to problems anymore, but wanted to do a better job of figuring out how we can prevent things from happening. So now. Uh, teaming up with him with with their running analysis and, and 3D evaluation and and creating programs, not just just running plans, but also biomechanic programs to help people really address some of these underlying issues so they can get out of pain, but then continue to function and run and train um, without long term issues. So let's see. So why this topic might matter for you guys, the, the, the injury rates in running are really staggering, to be honest with you. 60 to 70 percent of runners get injured each and every year. So if you're someone that just wants to run, stay healthy and, and, and train in a sustainable manner, um, I think this will be important for you. 
Um, next up, there's, there's so much advice out there. And you look at Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and all these different channels. And I think a lot of people are are putting out general recommendations. Uh, if you like me, there's a lot of things that I, I try just to test out to see how my body responds to it. But I always come back to uh, general recommendations and provide, create general results. So if we can do a better job being as specific as possible to our needs, and we can hopefully do only a few key drills, a few key exercises that create results and really get away from the frustration and the um, lack of results that that gen being general creates. Um, if you're someone that is training for some type of fall race, uh, this could be a perfect time as you get into August and September here to really address the body in a smart way, address the, the underlying mechanics and things that will help you run more efficiently, but hopefully reduce some of those aches and pains that we undoubtedly see as we ramp up our training. Mm -hmm. Now, what we envision for you moving forward beyond this webinar today is just to have a better understanding of how sports science and running analysis analysis can benefit you as a runner. Uh, I think it's very interesting to see what Dr. Deming is doing there uh, within the lab. I think a lot of people aren't really uh, yet, because we don't see a lot of this around. I know in this area, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's not a lot of people really doing this. So uh, trying to educate people on how that can, that can truly benefit you um, by being proactive and, and preventive, or if you're suffering from some type of injury, you can really input at any stage of your training to see good results and, and hopefully uh, be more effective and efficient as a runner. If you're someone that's suffering from an injury right now, um, this I think is, is very important and helpful that you can potentially find a solution. We'll talk about a few key things, your, your overpronation, your pelvic drop. There's obviously so many you can talk about as it relates to running and running mechanics, but hopefully we can dive into some areas that might be plaguing you and, and, and slowing you down. Um, also from a performance standpoint, if you're looking to improve performance, um, I think, and I look at some of the running analysis that I do, uh, very simple, right? You're using an iPad, you're looking at someone run, you might need more information, a, a more 3D look at running to see better performance. And I think that's what the information really provides here. Um, and then of course, after this webinar today, if there's anything you need from us, uh, feel free to use us as resources, whether you want to uh, try out the return to run program, if you have questions or, or just want to run something by us, we're, we're always there as a resource for you guys moving forward. So quick question for you guys before we get started. Uh, what brought you to the webinar today? I want to make sure as we get into some of the content and, and dig into the weeds here, uh, we're doing a good job answering your questions. So was there anything specific you wanted to get from the webinar today? We can try our best to answer that uh, as we go through within the content. And if it's something that's a little bit off topic, we'll make sure to add that into the Q&A. So take a second, click that Q&A button. Is there anything in particular that brought you to this webinar today? Give you guys a couple seconds to respond here. And then we'll dive into the content. So a couple things so far, injury prevention and best daily practices. So like I mentioned, we'll we'll talk about overpronation, specifically pelvic drops, since there's so much we can cover. I mean, this could probably be a entire uh, semester class, to be honest with you. Uh, so we'll talk about specific drills to address that. Um, Another really good one here. What is the single most important metric? I guess, is there one metric? And this might be good for you, uh, Dr. Deming, as you get into it. Is there one metric that you feel guarantees the best chance of success? I know this is a lot of different things to look at, but there, is there one that you find as a, I guess, a golden metric, if you will? So if anyone else has anything that you want us to cover specifically in the webinar, feel free to drop that at any point. We'll get rolling here just to make sure we're respectful of your, your Tuesday evening. So Dr. Deming, if you want to kick us off here. Sure, sure, yeah. So that was a loaded question there. I'm going to have to, <laughs> hopefully I'll pull the answer out of myself as I'm talking to some of these things tonight. Um, but it's a, a good question, though, I like it. So um, first thing we need to do is uh, kind of define sports science and talk about that because um, as Garrett said, this is, um, this is different. Um, having a lab like this, having a sports science lab like I do, uh, it is unique. There is really no place around um, West Michigan, um, certainly Southwest Michigan, even beyond um, the whole Midwest region that uh, very few places you can find that do, that are doing this outside of a major university, a research type center. So we're using this um, for the, gen you know, the, the general good of the public and, and keeping you healthy and avoiding anything that's going to take you away from those activities that you love. Um, 
so that's uh that that's very um um well so understanding what this is i mean the education of this is crucial uh, and that's that's exactly why we're here um, doing this webinar uh, because it is a, a a different topic for people to kind of wrap their heads around and um one thing too that garrett said that's kind of a good segue into uh, defining sports science is you know, when you're looking at the over thinking about the overwhelming amount of information that is out there on the web or on the uh, uh, social media and, and wherever else you can find it, or even books. I mean, there some are legitimate sources. I'm not saying that everyone out there, um, there, that nobody else out there knows what they're talking about. But certainly when you're, you know, you're taking advice from so many different angles, that's very overwhelming. And putting it to practice your day-to-day -day use. Um, you know, you can't do everything you see and you read, you know, you're, you're, you're just going to kind of it's like a hamster running on a wheel, right? You're not going to really get very far. So that kind of uh, helps define sports science right there is we're trying to trim the fat. We're using um, science, technology, research, what other people have done before us to build onto that and put that into use for very specific purposes to help you. Um, so the sports science by definition, as you can see um, on the slide here, the study of how the, the healthy human body reacts during exercise uh, from a cellular and a whole body perspective. That's just kind of a definition that, that I took uh, generally speaking when you're talking about sports science, but there's a, a number of different factors that go into that, right? So um, we're talking things like, you know, physiology, um, anatomy, psychology, biochemistry, kinesiology, biomechanics. Um, so a lot of different kind of practices coming in, coming into play here. Um, and there's so many different uses then that you can go from there, you know, from understanding and predicting outcomes uh, to helping you train more effectively and efficiently, um, physical and mental performance, um, and then, you know, nutrition, injury prevention and recovery needs. So um, opening a sports science lab uh, in Southwest Michigan here, you know, I'm not tackling all 500 things on the list of what's under sports science, but I am really trying to focus specifically on the biomechanics of things. That's that's part of my background. Um, I I didn't mention in my bio, but um, I have an undergraduate uh, bachelor of science in exercise science, and um, particularly studied biomechanics, and really put a lot of my continuing education efforts as a as a physician into the biomechanics of, of uh, running. That was, you know, a personal interest of mine and something that I feel is much, much needed because it is a an activity that we hope is going to keep us healthy, right? I mean, it's supposed to be uh, um, something we're doing for the good of our body and yet 60 to 70% of us are getting injured every year. So are we doing more harm than good? <laughs> you know, when you look at it that way. so. When done properly, yeah, absolutely. It's a healthy practice and it's great for you. And that's what we're here to help you explore. So do I have control to No, I realize. I'm going to click too. Okay. I can click. You might see in the bottom of yours as a remote control thing. I can click to switch mm -hmm. over to you, which I just did. Okay. You may have control now. Do I? All right. Let's give it a try. Uh, I don't know if I do. Maybe you have the control of the I can, I've got the cursor. <laughs> but anyways, I, that's 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 good because I didn't have that earlier. Um, so then the other the other term I wanted to find then is biomechanics. Because as I said, um, what I what I really focus on is study of biomechanics and um and analyzing and I, analyzing that. And that's a you know a big word that gets thrown around. And as runners out there, you guys have probably all heard of that term and are somewhat familiar with what biomechanics means in general, but um in just a definition, it's study of how forces interact with the human body. So some of the forces we're creating ourselves, some of the forces we're reacting to, um, and in particular, when we're running, typically that's the ground reactive force. You know, we're, um, we're reacting to how, how the ground is banging into our body repetitively. And, and what, what do we do from that force? What do we do with that force from there? So we're giving some force. We want to produce some force to make us you know run fast, propel ourselves through the air, but then we also need to react to that. So that's where the uh, the biomechanics is. So 
Um, taking a look then ne at the next slide, I think should show, yeah, just quick snapshot. So what does the sports science lab look like? So this is true to form. Um, and this is kind of the setup here. So um, as I said earlier, it's really the only one of its kind in all of Southwest Michigan. Um, so there's some technology there. Um, I've got 3D motion trackers. I've got um, force plates, which you can't quite see on the ground, um, cameras, and then, you know, monitors and everything to, to display that all um, in front of you. So you can see visually, um, you know, get that feedback as you're getting evaluated and, and watch yourself and learn from that in itself. The visual images you get from this are very, very powerful. Um, and then if we go forward um, to the next slide, uh, I'll show you a little bit then about what, what kind of information we can get from this lab and these evaluations. So this is the, the testing part that of the, the testing tracking training here of the, um, the title of this webinar here. Um, this is where the testing happens from, from my end. And these are, this is a snapshot here of um, somebody in the lab uh, recording some movement uh, tasks and the software records it. I put together a, um, a report and give you that feedback then. Um, so primarily when it comes to, you know, running, we're going to put, put you through specific sports specific tasks. So if it's running, you've got a set, you know, list of things you're going to do. We're going to measure things like mobility, strength, power, stability. Um, and then, you know, that, that gives you a sense of, injury awareness directly, you know, or specific to your, your body. And then we'll, we'll get into how to, you know, prevent those problems from happening. So go to the next slide here. We've got um, another snapshot here. Now this is kind of the, re yeah, this is a snapshot of the re scorecard for somebody doing a basic overhead squat test, just to give you again, an example, because this is new. I mean, this is different. I understand that. And when I tell people about what I do, I think that, well, I tend to see the wheels spinning in their head, like trying to picture this and um, the, you know, so the actual visual here, hopefully it helps a little bit. So she's on the force plate, she's doing the squat test. Um, in the background, there's all kinds of numbers and data about what her joint angles are doing, how, how fast she's, um, you know, rotating her, her hips, her knees and ankles are flexing and all that kind of stuff. And it, it gets analyzed through the software and then I kind of boil it down to scorecard where uh, you can see that on the left of the slide and um, you know those numbers then give you some objective findings that um, somebody with the expertise like Garrett then has to take those findings and uh, improve on them and we can track your progress and you can really see objectively how you're coming along and how your progress is and what it, what are we doing that's working what do we need to adjust make it better for you and that goes back to that you know trimming the fat and and focusing on you because you don't have three hours a day to do every exercise that you that you've seen on um, instagram that you should be doing as a runner according to social media you you don't have that time let's be realistic here so um that's what we that's what we can help um narrow down for you with this type of evaluation so next slide i believe shows then the uh, snapshot. This is the software behind the scenes that tracks joint angles, movements, and so these squiggly lines you're seeing are uh, different motion um, at the hips, the knees, the ankles um, as you're running on the treadmill, and you see the visual or the um, um, the skeleton animation up there in the corner. So I can kind of rotate that around. You can see it from different angles, which is Pretty cool tool, um, and you can see that right in front of you as you're as you're doing this evaluation. So now let's see. Oh, one more slide, I think, before we get into the specific ones that we came to talk about. This is a running report card. So this is slightly different than the one I showed you before, which was um, the overhead squat. This one gets into some of the um, here's some of those. Uh, parameters or biometrics that, you know, somebody asked, what's the most important one? I still haven't figured out the answer to that yet, but here's a list of some of the things that I have, um, you know, looking at your, your pronation, your ankle flexion, 
range of motion as you're going through your stance phase to your push off your hips, how much are they dropping or abducting? And that's a big one. And we're going to talk about that one today specifically. And then we can get um, contact time versus float time. And so we can see how much spring or bounce you're getting out of your steps. So that's a measure of efficiency and, and then your cadence um, and those kind of um, metrics as well to help with your, with your, you know, improve your running performance there. So this is just a snapshot here of like what your report would look like and some markups that I've done with some arrows and some, some lines to demonstrate certain things that stand out from this particular evaluation. Um, this zoomed in again on the report card, which I kind of just went through those, but you probably couldn't read them because they were small, but again, just kind of a list of some of the, um, um, biomechanic parameters we're looking at as I, um, uh, evaluate and, and put together your report card. So kind of explained that one already. So do you want to lead into this one or do you want me to just keep rolling? I feel like I've been hogging the microphone for me. I'll, I'll let you keep going. I'll jump in when we take, talk about the exercises. It should be good. All right. Fair so. enough. Yep. That's what. Okay. So um, we, we're going to dive in um, a little more with a little more detail into a, a couple of real common things that we see with runners and probably not new information to you out there listening that, yeah, these are important things for runners to um, work on or to to train, um, you know, specifically to avoid these type of things. But we're gonna we're gonna show you then and demonstrate how this type of you know biomechanic uh, or evaluation in the sports science lab can really get a quantitative look, very you know precisely uh, able to measure how much and what the cause is, because you may see an outcome visually, but putting it together as far as, you know, what the trigger of that was, it, that can be a little bit more complex. And so when you take a look at the whole chain of events in a sequence like this, you can say, well, is it, is it weakness around the ankle that's causing the knee to go in or is it weakness around the hip? You know, those kind of things. So um, what we're really going to help, well, we really are going to help you do is put together all those pieces of the puzzle so that um you know we really know which which areas to focus on specifically so hip or pelvic drop or hip stability so one of the biggest muscles in in running and a lot of other movements and just general posture and standing in general uh the the glute medius and the hip stabilizer so looking at a runner from behind you see, let's take start with the picture on the right. Do it. Can I have a control of the cursor again? Right now, you. I think you should right now. Okay. Now try that. I did earlier. Now it's just. Did you put it right there, sitting on the knee? Yeah, I did. I think it says it's on you I'm though. Not, I'm not moving it. Do I need to click something? Now I got it. I think. Oh, and I think I changed slides. Go. Yeah, now I have control. Beautiful. I got it. All right. So let's take a look at this picture here. Um, so this is a visual look. And you can see this from behind, you know, with, with your typical, uh, you know, running evaluation. Somebody watched you run on a treadmill and you video record it. You can see the hip drop um, a lot of times visually. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's subtle. But when this runner here on the right is fully loaded mid stance on the right foot, um, all the weights coming down here and we're supporting this with one limb. And you see the opposite hip drop down. So what is that telling us? The muscles on this side of the hip over here are not firing in order to stabilize her pelvis here. So you can see the tilt in the pelvis. Run on the left, you can see the same thing. When she's on her right side, her hip, her left hip drops. When you look at her on her left side, actually, she stays more or less perpendicular to the ground. She's in a much different position. Um, and this is a runner who is actually dealing with uh, an injury on the right side, which very much explains that. Um, but with the, the, with the runner on the, the right, she was actually a very healthy runner. And she's actually a very, uh, she's a really good solid runner um, in the Kalamazoo area. And she's been running for a long time. And 
Um, she is a she's a very strong runner. Um, but look at the effects that this has on her her knee and then her foot too. You can see the outside of her um, her right foot is really kind of almost coming off the ground. She's she's rolling in. And we'll talk about the pronation factor in a little bit. So that's a visual look at it. And now let's take a look at the, oh, I, I thought I could change slides. There we go. Now let's take a look at visual or um, behind the scenes, what this is going to look like and how we can um, really see ways in which we can improve this. Okay. So this is a freeze frame here as this runner is loaded on her right foot in mid stance. So what's happening as she's coming down on that right foot, remember this is the side I said that she has an injury on. So as she's coming down, loading all of her weight on that right, on that right limb, the left hip is dropping. So there's something not holding this side up to keep her, her level. And visually on the kinematic graph of her right hip, this purple line is right hip abduction. So if you don't know what abduction is, basically the leg moving outward from the hip. So abduction is away while adduction is going inward. And you can see from this angle, her thigh angle, that she's actually going inward towards the center of her body. So that's adduction, ADD. And that's why she's dropping down into the negative here. Now, the fact that she's going down into the negative isn't all that bad, but it's a very steep decline here. And then there's a little notch here as well before it rounds and circles back up. This is really demonstrating um, the instability part. So it's not that she's just lacks the strength. It's also that there's a very unstable loading pattern of it. So two things that we want to see improve from the you know, biomechanics standpoint here, we want to see a less steep loading curve, meaning her hip is not adducting quite so fast. And then we want to see it smooth out a little bit before it returns. So this is a very, I took this snapshot here because I think this is a really good visual depiction of what I'm looking at when I'm analyzing the 3D motion analysis. All right, so let me go to the next slide. And then that has to be translated into something you know that you can kind of quantify here so this is a quantifying the um the hip abduction and eccentric that's a fancy word that basically means uh, you may have heard of eccentric muscle contraction that's when your muscles contract or do the work while they're lengthening so that's loading when you're coming down and landing your muscles are, are loading the forces. So that's the eccentric phase and looking at the hip abduction, the difference on the right versus the left. Okay, so she's undergoing this much more on the right than she is on the left. And that's a quantitative, you know, that's a way of, you know, finding it really objectively. How are you right now? And as we go through the tracking process and we were to reevaluate you after doing some work or, you know, after going through some training um, and focusing on this, then we can take a look at those numbers and hopefully see that improving on the right side. Basically with her, as, as she works through, you know, recovering from her injury and getting stronger, um, almost guaranteed that we're going to see that improve. So that is where I work together with Garrett um as the expert on you know taking that information and then putting it into practical use to you because otherwise it's just fancy numbers and pictures right so there's somebody on the other side who's an expert who can help you put this into practical use so that should lead into garrett that's a that's a good question um there we go all right so Put together a couple exercises here. Let me just change this for a second so I can point. Um, a couple exercises. If we think about pelvic drop, like you mentioned, uh, really strengthening that that 
gluteus medius muscle, gluteus minimus muscle in particular, and teaching how to abduct into the hip. Now, I'm not a, to be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of, I think we, bands are good, and you'll see I include some band exercises at certain points. I really like when we're trying to strengthen the, this gluteus medius and build strength and stability around that uh, lateral hip to really get down on the ground in what we call a modified single leg side plank. So as you're in this side, side plank position, the bottom knee is driving down into the ground. We're driving into that that hip abduction position, which will strengthen the lateral hip and glute medius. Um, as we lift up that top leg, we're really relying on that lower side of the body to strengthen obliques and glute medius. Um, this is something that we want to build up. I try to get people to, and this is the modified or first step, which I find a lot of people do, do pretty well with initially, get them in a position where they can load uh, and strengthen that glute medius. And then over time, can we hold that for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds before going into the true single leg side plank position, which I find a lot of people really struggle with and lack that uh, that glute strength to be able to hold. So that's kind of one of the first steps that I put people into just to start building strength in that lateral hip area. From there, just teaching people what, what it feels like to move that pelvis in the frontal plane. So we talk about pelvic drop. I find a lot of people have a hard time connecting with what that really means. So as we add in this more neuromuscular um, type exercise, it's a, a hip hike to single leg stance. So we're all we're doing, you see, as I step and strike the ground, I'm lifting my opposite side pelvis. It's a good view from the front here. So as I strike with my left foot, then I'm going to lift up the right side pelvis. I'm just teaching that pelvis how to move in the frontal plane um, to just truly appreciate that. Because we want to make sure as we're landing and we're bearing weight, we're loading into a single leg. We're not dropping excessively into that uh, pelvic drop. So let's just teach you how to move in and out of that position to better appreciate it. And then we can put that into play with other single leg uh, type exercises. Now, next one here, and I mentioned a second ago, not a huge band fan. Um, this is actually a, a good exercise where the band is used not to strengthen the right hip. It, it, at first glance, it looks like we're trying to strengthen the hip abductors on the right side, when in reality, I'm trying to, I'm elevating my body, I'm getting up into a position where that pelvis is level and not slightly elevated on that right side. And then all the band is doing is it's providing a disruption to my stabilizing leg. So now as my left leg goes out to the side, the band is tugging at that right leg to try to pull me out of position. So I'm really needing that glute medius on the leg I'm standing on. Um, I need to prevent the knee from collapsing. I need to prevent the foot from pronating, right? It's a lot of different things that need to go on here to, to really create good single leg stability. Um, and this is really a, one that I like to teach good pelvic control. Now you'll see, and in something I, I thought about as I was putting these videos in, uh, I'm a real big advocate for getting out of the shoes. As we talk about improving some of the single leg stabilization, these videos are probably a little before I started to really uh, go further down that, uh, that, that, that viewpoint there. So I would highly recommend taking the shoes off, feeling that foot connected with the ground and then working on stability, um, in that position. Cause I think we can really use some of that sensory input from the foot as well. And now like everything, and like Dr. Deming said, we need to really withstand and, and bear a lot of load and absorb force into a single leg. So our, our final step, whether we're rehabbing or improving performance to me is always, how do we uh, incorporate some type of plyometric drill and teach ourselves how to withstand force, absorb, and then stay in the right position as we're literally bounding from one leg to the next. So this is the medial to lateral jumps. Um, simple but challenging exercise. You can see hand around, hands around my hips. I'm jumping laterally side to side, which is really going to create more activation through that glute medius, which are trying to um, not only get stronger, but just improve how well it controls and stabilizes the pelvis. And then as I land, taking a second on each foot, then to land, to stabilize, to bend into the ankle, the knee, and the hip while maintaining levelness through the pelvis, you'll see, and I see a lot of runners, I was working with a woman this morning, as she jumped laterally, laterally from side to side, just the, the inability to control herself. She would land on one leg, and as she would land, that pelvis would drop, and her whole and the single leg stabilization would, she, she would kind of collapse in and lose her position. So we always want to focus on something like this. Less distance is always better initially. Can we control ourselves in a very controlled manner? And then from there, can we jump a little bit longer, a little bit wider over time, more force as we come down into a single leg to really build that control um, through the leg and also the pelvis here. So those are some simple exercises. 
Um, again, depending on if there, there are things that you're incorporating within your program right now, but I think overall, just the concept of stabilizing and, and, and finding that levelness throughout the pelvis is important. I tell a lot of people, whether it's a step up, uh, it could be a reverse lunge, a forward lunge, um, anything where you're on a single leg, you need to really focus on uh, thinking and connecting with how well are you stabilizing that pelvis? Because a lot of times we can do different movements and the movement could be strong and it might feel stable, but then when you look at it, just constantly just dropping and just dropping. And I think those are the little things within our strength training program that do translate to running if we're not really focusing on it. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to move on now and, and talk about the P word pronation. Uh, as runners, I imagine you've heard of the word pronation. You probably know what pronation means. Um, but just to be clear, uh, first of all, pronation is a normal natural movement. Um, some people don't realize that. Some people think of that pronation means, oh, that's a bad thing. Or even the term over pronation, you know, that's, that's something that you'll hear a lot, or you may go get fitted for running shoes. And say, oh, you're an over pronator. Over pronate, um, over pronate is kind of a, it's a loose term. Um, this is a uh, world class runner. I don't know if any of you know who, who he is out there. He was just in the Olympics, and his first name is right there on the back of his running bib, which might give it away. Um, that's a zoomed in image of his left foot. Now, if you know what pronation is, that's pronation. All right. Uh, can I change the, yeah, I should be able to change the slide. So this is Joshua Chepagay, and he just won the gold medal in Paris for the 10K. Um, he's a world record holder in the 5, 10, five and 10K uh, meter, actually, currently. And I don't, I've never seen anybody pronate more than, well, I've seen people pronate more than him. I've never seen an athlete, a runner, they pronate more than him. Um, there are a lot of good runners, though, who pronate more than you could imagine. Um, and uh in all sports and what the key is here is that this man has incredible foot strength intrinsic muscle and ankle um extrinsic muscle supporting strength to turn that pronation into a spring basically and that's anatomically how our feet were designed to work so our let, let me back up just for a second um defining pronation okay just just in case you're not perfectly clear so the foot works in three different planes of motion all right all the not the ankle we're talking below the ankle now so there's lots of bones in the foot lots of joints in the foot and they they kind of give you this sort of collapsing three plane of motion movement in your foot and when you step down, it's like a, it's kind of like spring loading on the arch. That's why our feet were designed with an arch. Now, some people have a pretty flat arch. That's just the way they were born. Some people have a really high arch, but nonetheless, that's how our foot was meant to function. So the pronation is when your foot kind of comes down and, and rolls inward, as you can see from this picture. The opposite of that is supination. So there's pronation and supination, and those are three plane movements, all right? So this is maybe a little bit technical and it's okay if you don't understand at all, but I just want you to understand, um, I don't wanna blow past the fact and just take for granted everybody knows what pronation is and what supination is. Um, so let's move along here and then we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how this pronation supination action works as a spring for your body, okay? So I talk about springs a lot. Um, with my with my clients with my patients and with all runners um your joints have mechanical springs then your muscles and tendons have mechanical spring action to them and what we're trying to do to make you um a, a strong healthy and fast runner is to maximize that uh, spring efficiency so efficiency is really the key word and you know um running coaches and trainers and um, physical therapists will, you know, will, will use that term efficiency. Well, there's, there's a lot of different types of efficiency. Uh, well, there's a few different types. You know, there's metabolic efficiency and, and, and physiologic efficiency and those kind of um, 
a, a little bit different. This is mechanical efficiency we're talking about, um, hence the biomechanics. So we want to get a good return on our energy so that we're not constantly wasting and overusing our own energy here. And that pronation can work to our advantage if we know how to control. It. So that's that's what we're um, going to kind of get into here. So this is a kinematic graph then of the uh, the yellow on the bottom down here is of the uh, left foot, and um, in the for all intents and purposes pronation supination measurement here. So what we're seeing is, or what you'll see is going through the gait cycle here. So this is foot strike. When the foot hits the ground, we're at the peak here of supination. So the foot slightly turned inward when you hit the ground. And then you're going to undergo this pronation to, you know, as you load weight on it. Your foot just goes through into this pronation. And that's where everybody's going to vary to some extent. So this is boom when the foot hits the ground. And one thing you notice right off the bat is that's a pretty steep drop. So it happens quickly. All right, it can happen more rapidly in some than others. And then it's going to reverse as we're going through mid stance and then toe off. And then usually as your foot swings through, it kind of everts a little as it swings through. And then you're getting ready for another foot strike here. So following that along, that's one step. So now his foot's hitting the ground again, rapid pronation, he's fully loaded. And we're looking at the left foot here over on the picture. So he's getting close to the toe off phase right there. That's where the red line is paused or the, the cursor is paused at this moment in time. And what I'm pointing out here is that he's continuing to supinate beyond toe off because this is basically toe off and you can see the line is still going up. So his foot is supinating through toe off and pushing off. All right, so that's kind of the action that we want to see. This is actually a good action of pronation to supination. And he's a young runner. Um, he's got pretty good spring to his step. So um, we're seeing that. And I, I think then what we're going to compare this to is on the next slide. Okay, so this is the landing part. All right, so that was the toe off part, how, how you pronate through. In this picture, you can see this the, the cameras and the animation here, this is all synced with the graphs on the side. So this is where the um, where we're paused, where this red line is, right where she's kind of bottoming out. She's fully loaded, mid stance. This is where she landed. She, pro, she pronated that much. Now she's going to start supinating as she goes to push and toe off. And we got a pretty decent smooth curve coming down underneath here. And that's what you want to see. Just like that hip graph that I showed you, we don't want a lot of like notches in there, or little um, wiggles going on. That's showing that there's a lot of correction and, and inefficiencies happening. So this is a pretty good smooth curve. And, and, and she's a pretty strong runner too. Um, so I'm going to compare two landing curves now. And you'll see this was the one before with that younger runner coming down here. And you can see this notch. You can see that little um, inefficiency is what I simply call it versus this one here where it's a little bit smoother and it's coming back up and kind of hard to see maybe, but you could see this isn't quite as steep either how she's coming down um, versus the younger runner who's really slamming down hard and then you know really got to uh, um, absorb that all that energy and that shock and then resupinate and she's she's supinating through as well her toe off is actually this little notch right here would be about toe off so again visually i want to show you what we're looking at from the testing side of things how we can tell the difference yes they both had pretty good um Bring, yes, they both, you know, visually look like they're bouncing off the treadmill pretty good. Um, but one of them you can see is uh, definitely a lot less efficient. I'm not surprising that it's the younger runner uh, because they typically haven't um, put in the work on these uh, on these finer points that we're 
that we're going to treat. So here's another um, quick pronation curve. And this one is um, demonstrating another problem with pronation where, so here's her foot strike. Here's the pronation. She's landing and loading. But then as she gets to toe off, as you can see over there in the picture, she's just about to toe off here. She's going the other way. She's going downward here. She's continuing to pronate. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. that's correct. She's continuing to pronate through push off. And remember, I said earlier, you should be supinating as you go through push off. Why should you be supinating? Because your big toe should be providing most of that propulsion and most of that final energy as you push. So, as your big toe is working, it's going to tilt your foot towards the outer, outer side, and that's going to cause supination. Now, in, in this case, she is not doing that. She's actually going the other way, and her foot's rolling in all the way through push-off. So she's losing a lot of action of that big toe joint, or the FHL, flexor hallucis longus muscle, and other intrinsic muscles that are helping to stabilize and strengthen her arch. So that brings us to a really, you know, another key point that we're going to, um, I'm going to turn it over to Garrett then to talk about is that strength and what the significance of that is within the arch and, and using using those muscles to give you a good spring and good bounce. Now, as we look at how to build foot, ankle, and arch straight, I always like to start simple with neuromuscular control or building toe dexterity. Um, as much as I say that's simple, these are often very challenging drills to, to do for people. Um, we often do so much with our hands, right? We write, we, we have a lot of small fine motor skills and tasks that we perform on a regular basis. When it comes to our feet, we strap our feet into shoes, we, we tie them down, and we go out and run. And therefore, I find people have very poor neuromuscular control uh, of the feet and the toes. So starting with something simple like toe yoga, I think it's a common one that a lot of uh, a lot of runners have done before, whether it's a PT from plantar fasciitis, a post-tib tendinopathy, or, or some other um, lower extremity injury. All this does is it helps build that neuromuscular control between the big toes and the smaller toes. We have different muscles that control the big toe compared to the smaller toes. So we should be able to differentiate that motion, big toe down, small toes up, small toe down, big toe, big toe up. And something I found you need to work on consistently throughout the day um, can't just do it one time and, and think it's going to improve, but small bouts throughout the day just to really build that connection. This is really the the foundation, I think, of, of building good neuromuscular control strength and also stability of the foot um, to have that, that fine motor skill. Next up here, we have what's called foot doming. So when it comes to foot doming, a little bit different now, you can see that the main premise here is just, it's really shortening into that arch. We're trying to pull the base of that first metatarsal towards the heel and really shorten that arch, some of those smaller flexors in the foot. Um, this helps build rigidity and stiffness within the foot. Um, like Dr. Deming said, the foot is a, it should become a rigid lever as that arch really maintains its integrity before we push off and acts as a spring. So we wanna be able to really be strong and stiff within the arch of the foot, and this helps build that. Next exercise, and one of my favorite, is what's called toe splaying. So I do an exercise called lift spread reaches, the slightly different variation where you can see pushing the big toe into the ground and then splaying and trying to separate those lesser toes because we're so often in uh, different types of shoes, whether it's dress shoes, running shoes. Over time, we, we tend to be a little bit more compressed and pulled into that um, that position there. So if we can create a nice wide base of support, um, what happens is we can then um, have a nice wide base to be stable. So that foot can really contact the ground here as a nice wide base, as opposed to being narrow and more unstable. Um, this builds some of that strength and stability that we need to prevent over pronation or that rapid rate of pronation as we uh, tend to see people who collapse inward. From there, what do we do? So we've worked on dexterity of the toes. We're, we're, we're building in flexion extension. We're working on stiffness. We're teaching the foot how to splay 
all those things really come in handy um, and play a pivotal role when it comes to single leg strength and stabilization. But we need to get you upright. We need to get you loading the foot. Running is a single leg plyometric like activity, two to six times your body weight coming down on a single leg. Um, so we need to really work on getting more specific to the demands of running, as you'll see in these next three videos. First one here, just a simple single leg balance drill, getting you on a single leg. I'm trying to create a nice wide base, push that big toe into the ground to maintain the integrity of the arch. And then you can see here going into a small degree of knee flexion, obviously with running, running in and through mid stance specifically, um, knee is in a small degree of flexion. So we want to mimic that as much as possible, but really focusing on pressing that big toe into the ground, maintaining the integrity of the foot in the arch. So we're not always rolling too far into pronation or over pronating. And we're also not hanging out on the outside of the foot and supinating. We're in a nice stable position um, where we can really uh, engage a lot of those smaller intrinsic muscles and maintain the integrity of the arch in the foot. From there, I like to put into bigger movement patterns. The step up is one of my favorites for pelvic control we talked about earlier to now um, foot and arch strength. You can use this anywhere. Um, knee valgus, if that knee is collapsing, there's a lot of different ways you can use the step up. I like this one because it's more dynamic compared to that last drill as we're moving up throughout that range of motion and controlling back down. Need to really look to see what the foot is doing. Can we create a wide base, right? Splay the toes, push those toes down into the platform, and then drive up through that range of motion without losing the foot in either direction. Um, you'll tend to see, and especially if you, if you have your shoes off for these drills, you'll tend to see a compensation either collapsing too far into pronation or shifting to the lateral side of the foot and supinating. Um, if we can really get that foot to be, to be grounded and planted firmly into the step, we can train stability here that will translate over to as that foot's in contact with the ground as we run. And like Dr. Deming said, the foot is a um, should be a rigid lever. So now as we look at these ankle hops, again, trying to create, really keep the knees somewhat straight, um, use the foot in that ankle as a rigid lever as we kind of load into that foot and angle, ankle and explode off the ground. This is working on the elasticity component. If you think of a pogo stick, that's why people call these ankle hops or pogo jumps. Uh, we're teaching the foot to be to be strong, but also to be powerful and training the, the, the stiffness of the foot, the Achilles in the calf. Now, when it comes to your training plan specifically, there's a couple different things you need to think about. When, it, when we wanna retrain form, right? We, we've done some type of 3D running analysis that Dr. Deming provides. Um, starting simple and really resolving that dysfunction first, I think it becomes very challenging for people if we say, here, you, this is how you run. I want you to do this. Um, a lot of times our body changes over time. We, we compensate or we alter our running form because there's something, there's some type of weakness or lack of stability or imbalance or something going on in the, in the underlying system that we're not aware of. So first we need to address that and build that up to a point where we're resolving that dysfunction. So as we start to manipulate some of these variables and change running form, the person can more readily do that and see success while doing that. So Resolving the, the dysfunction first and foremost. Next, working on running form in a controlled environment. So whether it's trunk lean, is it arm swing, is it foot strike, type of foot strike, where the foot is landing in relation to the body to prevent overstriding, foot pronation, pelvic drop, right? If we can do these things in a controlled environment first, I find people really understand, hey, what they're trying to do. Because as we get out and run, running is, even though if, if we're running easy and conversational, um, it's still fast and it's still hard to put some of these running form um, changes into running as you're outdoors because there's so much to think about and it's a lot faster than people think. It's hard to really get those changes to happen and to do them well. So if we can incorporate different drills, do them uh, as part of your dynamic warm up, do them before your strength training routine, do them randomly throughout the day. Uh, I find doing them in a controlled environment first can really help then in your next step incorporate within your runs because ultimately we want things to translate. We don't want to just work on uh, toe yoga, building better uh, toe dexterity, and then there's nothing. 
that then allows the better dexterity to create better stability in the foot that then translates into more stabilization and better running mechanics. We need these things to translate over. There was a good research article from 2015 um, that showed after a six week hip strengthening program and all these people, they improved strength, they improved alignment of the knee and all these different things that they were working on. Um, but they found that just building strength alone within that controlled environment did not improve running form. Uh, so we really need to go do better job if improving running form is one of the goals and it's something that's needed to be a more successful and resilient runner. Uh, we need to really allow people to not just address these things within their rehab and strength program, but work on the drills, work on really incorporating those things within the runs itself. So that fully translates over for you to have better running form and mechanics. If not, you're probably getting stronger. You're probably under, you're improving these things in a controlled environment, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're actually happening while you run. Now, a couple of things that I want people to really understand is, is when we look at running, there's different variables. If we think about the running plan specifically um, that we can manipulate, a lot of people are going about this wrong. And yes, a lot of injuries happen due to poor biomechanics, poor running form, muscle imbalances, those types of things I mentioned a second ago. Um, however, you, your running plan is very important here. There was a research article uh, years ago that showed 50% of running related injuries are attributed to training errors. So if you're building up mileage too quickly, you don't have a drop back week or enough recovery built in with your plan, there's too much intensity in the form of speed work, there's a chance that your running plan could be contributing and exacerbating some of these biomechanical issues that we're seeing that Dr. Deming pointed out a little while ago. So I highly recommend thinking about these three things, frequency first, how many days per week are you running, duration, how long are your individual runs, and then how many miles are you running per week within your training plan, and then intensity. Um, typically, I like to follow what's called the 80-20 rule, which means 80-20 principle, which means 80% of your runs are easy and conversational. About 20% is speed work. Um, that is a, a good balance. There's been some research on that over the years to show that's a, a very effective way to train to reduce your likelihood of injury, but also improve performance. So if we can make sure from a training plan standpoint, we're following a smart a strategic and gradual training plan that builds us up over time. We're not making big jumps in uh, mileage or intensity or, or different areas which are harder for the body to adapt to. That mix with a lot of the biomechanical things we talked about today would be a really good recipe for you to be successful long term as an endurance runner. So what we covered in the webinar today, one, um, Dr. Demme did a great job looking at his 3D running and biomechanical evaluation. And this is, the thing is awesome. Um, sometimes I feel guilty when when I we're, we're working together and he sends me that report and pretty much I have all my information right there and I can just prescribe the, the right exercises. It makes my job a lot easier. Um, also talked about what kind of running form data can be collected and why that matters to you. And then three, we discussed different um exercises and drills to address poor movement patterns, specifically pelvic drop and overpronation, uh, to run faster, stronger, and longer while reducing your risk of injury. So question for you guys right now, do you see one to two simple areas you can improve within your training plan right now? Uh, if so, take a second, draw, do me a favor and drop a comment here, click the Q&A button, drop a comment so we can kind of see what you got from the webinar today, because we would love to hear from you. I'll wait a second just to get a couple people to chime in and then we'll kind of keep going here and wrap up to be respectful of your of your evening. Awesome. So first thing we see first, first, uh, something someone picked up here. Um, now the different things that you could pick up with the, the 3D analysis, I guess this person had a um, had a running analysis done in the past, but to see some of the graphs and some of that additional data, and then especially understood that we talked about and doing a pre-test and post-test to see how mechanics change over time. As you as you test mechanics on the front end, you run through some type of running retraining or, or, or injury prevention program and then retest afterwards. Um, thought that'd be pretty pretty beneficial just to make sure um, they, they no, don't just think they're seeing better running form, but they're actually seeing objective uh, improvements. Um, other person here, different drills on pelvic control, was not aware 
uh, never really thought about the pelvis in that way, which I always find interesting. I think we always look at the knee, right? We see the knee collapsing in or the foot collapsing in. We often don't think about how the pelvis moves that way. So um, this person picked up that that hip hike, the hip hike to single leg stance drill to work on teaching the pelvis to move and said they'll be more mindful of of kind of putting that in play with their strength training program as they do lunges and other single leg movements. All right, guys, well, let's keep moving on here. Um, we just want to, again, welcome you. If you guys feel like you're at a point where you need help with your running, um, you're, you've been struggling with injuries over the years, or you're looking to improve performance, maybe you're getting ready for a fall uh, fall goal race, half marathon, full marathon, or beyond. Um, I do think the return to run program would be an, a, a, a huge fit for a lot of people because it's, again, it's individualized to you. You get your three-year running analysis, you get your, your training plan, your running plan, all of those pieces together. So it's 100% individualized, which means it really it fits and can be catered to every person. Um, three big outcomes you'll see if you're, if, you're interested in participating in the return to run program. Um, one is more alignment with your running goals. So if you are again struggling with injury, you're trying to improve performance, this program will really help identify those key things and then create a training plan um, that helps address them. Um, Cause ultimately we want, like you see here in the middle, less aches, pains, improved running performance. We want you to run and, and, and run in an unrestricted way. Uh, we don't want you struggling with injuries. We don't want you can just consistently frustrated that you're not, uh, achieving your goals or you're you're not able to hit the paces that you're that you're looking for we want you to be as efficient as possible as a runner but also staying healthy for a long enough period of time where you can um, achieve those big goals because uh, ultimately we want you to run faster stronger and longer which i think is the goal for for every endurance athlete if we can run faster stronger and longer hopefully we're we're continuing to see good results long term um, less likely to become injured but also uh, able to continue to, to achieve some of those PRs, which I know is, is, is pretty motivated for us. Now, when you sign up for the return to run program, here's what you receive, um, on Dr. Deming's side of things, which is really, uh, is huge, right? To identify the key areas is that 3D running analysis and testing, um, looking at get you on the treadmill, putting some of the sensors and things on you to understand what does your running form look like. And then he kind of digs into the mad scientist behind the seat, digs into all, all this data, um, compiles the reports, you know exactly what needs to be work on. Rather than saying, hey, your running form stinks, work on everything. You know, what are those one to two things that that are possibly breaking down that are predisposing you to injury or not allowing you to run in an efficient manner. Next up, once I get that information and you kind of move on to the, the training phase of things, whether it's a rehab or strength training and performance training, um, we use that information and create an eight week program. Um, this is broken down into two different phases. So the first phase is a four week program, um, get people started, understand how we're we going to work on improving running mechanics, um, are we going to address any muscle imbalances, lack of range of motion in particular area, just issues with form in general? And then we create a program around that. Um, at that next four-week phase, then we take things to the next level. At that point, you should be seeing good results and really gaining some momentum. The next four-week phase, we really start to progress some of those exercises. So we're, we're leaving you in a good place where you can see the best long-term results. Um, there is the access to a coaching app. So I use what's called True Coach. This allows me, whether you're coming in person to see me or you're doing the self-guided option, you can follow the True Coach app. All your exercises are in there, video demonstrations, how many sets and repetitions, how many days per week to do it and we can really build that out to make sure it fits you fits around your running uh, fits around your work schedule family life and i think this this whole program is very customizable to make sure you're um you're, you're seeing success or remaining accountable um along the way any questions any concerns anything you need to to get checked out if things are not going smoothly um, myself and dr deming are there whether you need to set up a call or you need to drop in to, to look at anything. Um, I think that's the big reason why we don't offer this to the masses. We only have a few limited spots available because we try to spend as much possible time with each person um, so you're successful as opposed to opening to everyone. And then once you do your exercises, you're kind of on your own. Um, you have a lot of support and a lot of guidance along the way. Uh, we're in the we're in your corner to really help you see success. So he's there if you need to check in at True to Form um, and have an appointment with him. You obviously be working with me regularly, whether it's within the coaching app with the self-guided program or one-on-one -on, -one on a weekly basis. There's a lot of support to make sure you, you, you see success with this program. Now, what to do right now? 
if you are interested in this program, this does not mean you need to sign up in any way. This is just kind of starting that conversation. Um, if you can click that Q&A button, which many of you have commented at some point throughout the, the webinar today, click the Q&A button, write R to R, which means return to run. That's just telling us, hey, you're interested in learning more about the program. What will happen after you input your uh, input that in the Q&A, Dr. Deming will follow up over the next couple of days just to have a phone con consultation with you, understand more about your goals, uh, you're running right now, what that looks like, any upcoming races, what's your injury history, um, and then decide if you're a good fit for the program. Like I said, the program is completely customizable um, to your goals and what you need. So usually most people will, um, and this is a program that will fit for majority of runners, um, unless there's some financial issues or time issues on being able to come in for the evaluations and some of the sessions. Um, there are only three spots available. Like I mentioned a second ago, we try to individualize this and spend as much time with people as possible so we don't open it to the masses. And I, and I think so far that has helped us really maintain a very high quality program product and service uh, for some of these runners locally here to see great results. So take a second, click that Q&A button. I already see that button uh, lighting up on my end. So a couple of people interested. Um, again, we'll reach out. Uh, Dr. Demi will reach out, schedule that phone consultation with you and, and talk more in the coming week or so. But I hope we have the opportunity to work with some of you here very soon. All right, guys, so that is it. I, I wanna say thank you for joining us on the webinar today. It's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Dr. Deming and myself. Um, hopefully we can do more of these in the future. Um, we'll talk to some of you over the next week just concerning the Return to Run program. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A right now. We'll hang out for a couple of minutes to answer some of those. Um, if you feel like you got all your questions answered, you want to get on with your, uh, your, your Tuesday night, you're more than welcome to. But I just want to say thank you once again. Hope you guys had a, had a great evening. You enjoyed the webinar. And hopefully you learned a, a thing or two that will help take your running to the next level. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening.